Hello again people and welcome to part 2 of my Deltarune character breakdown series. Today we'll be talking about the Savage Sullen Serpent, also known as Susie. If you haven't seen part 1 already, it'll be somewhere down below. Like before, this video will maintain the past, present, and future structure. Who was Susie before the events of Deltarune? How has she changed in response to the events so far? And, knowing all of this, what will the future hold for this angie little lizard? But first, a quick addendum to the Chris video. I made the choice to leave out Chris's reactions to the secret bosses, on the grounds that the video was designed to discern Chris's motivations from their actions. Both Spamton and Jevil's encounters require intentional action from the player to take place, so therefore, I did not see fit to include them, because fighting them was not a direct decision from Chris. After reading through the arguments and points from people who disagreed with my decision, I must admit that decision was a mistake. So from now on, I will be including character analysis from all aspects of the game. And yes, this also includes the Snowgrave route events. Let us begin the story of Susie, the Violet Tormentor. For the present moment, the majority of Susie's past is a mystery. So take this section with the caveat that we truly don't know where she came from. We can only make assumptions. Our first glimpses of Susie's past come from the Spamton sweepstakes, where Noelle recounts her time spent observing Susie's actions. Of course, I am referring to the post from Noelle's personal blog, where she talks about Susie's harassment of Chris. Noelle refers to Susie as the new girl in both the title of the blog post and the post itself. Noelle is well aware of Susie's name, as we see further down, but takes the time to specifically refer to her as the new girl. I am almost certain this was an intentional choice by Toby Fox to let us know that Susie has recently moved to hometown, or at the very least is relatively new to the school Noelle and Chris are attending. Noelle goes on to explain how one day both Chris and Susie decided to stay late after class. Chris more so because they were still asleep, but Susie seemingly had an agenda to carry out. Noelle picks up on Susie's intent, but leaves the room to watch as events unfold. A very interesting thing to do, that's all I'm saying for now. I mean, if I saw my friend sleeping and the only other person in the room was their bully, I would absolutely wake them up so they could leave safely with me. But we can open that can of worms in her video. Back to Susie. Susie wakes up Chris and begins to have a conversation with them regarding their hair. Chris uses an apple scented shampoo. This naturally invokes a reaction from Susie, as she is noted several times throughout the game to be hungry. This really has me wondering if this is one of the reasons that Susie hates Chris. Susie sits at her desk all class and sits behind this human who smells like a sweet delicious fruit. This only reminds her of how hungry she is. A small thought, but I am certain that Susie has a multitude of reasons for doing what she's about to do. Susie then refers to the shampoo as apple flavor, implying that she believes you can eat shampoo rather than use it to wash your hair. Susie takes a massive bite out of the apple and follows up with a threat to Chris. Susie warns that she will be biting Chris if they keep smelling like apples. She wants Chris to stop using that deliciously smelling shampoo, so to intimidate them, she threatens a visceral demise. Much like in other instances, Chris is unfazed and, dare I say, entertained by Susie's threat. After not getting the reaction she wants, Susie doubles down and chucks the apple at Chris. Susie becomes even more angry and proceeds to grab Chris by the hair. One day your mom's gonna get sick of you, you little freak, and as soon as that happens, someone might make you disappear, and she'll finally realize how happy she was without you. Susie does not believe this. The very first time we see Susie talking about Toriel, she gives nothing but praise. Susie has projected her feelings towards her own mother onto Chris, but the big question is, why? The most direct answer would be that this is what Susie believes she is. Her own parents make her feel like she is a burden on them, an annoyance, a freeloader squatting in their home, expecting ridiculous things like being able to eat every day of the week. This is Susie's reality, so hungry she settles for eating school supplies nonchalantly staying after class because she knows she isn't missed at home, making another student feel like their mother doesn't love them. Parents are either unfit or too short-tempered or too stressed to handle the challenges of parenthood, so they insult their child creating this narrative that it is the child who is being unreasonable. It's a very toxic coping mechanism. 
To avoid facing the reality that they are awful parents, they shift the blame to the very children they are supposed to care for. What was really interesting to me was the very action that set Susie off. Obviously, she's upset that she isn't getting the reaction she wants, and she doubles down by throwing the apple at Chris. But I think what really sends her is the fact that Chris catches the apple and then takes a bite out of it themselves. Not only did Chris have the reflexes to deflect it and catch it, but they added on an extra layer of disrespect by taking a bite themselves. I think this incredibly unexpected feat caught Susie off guard and potentially grossed her out to the point where she was afraid of Chris. So just to prove she wasn't afraid, she escalated right to violence. We'll talk about this so much throughout this video, but fear is ultimately the driving force of Susie's actions, especially in chapter 1. This is the most notable scene of Susie's past that we have so far. What remains are just bits and pieces, small but still useful information. In chapter 2, Susie is noted to be familiar with the video game called Dragon Blazers 2, a faux video game series within the Deltarune universe. Noelle is shown playing a game from the same series in the hospital in chapter 2. At most, this is side information that could lead to a candid conversation between Susie and Noelle, as they are both fans of the series. While we are on the subject of Noelle and Susie, I think it is very clear that Toby intends for these two characters to form a close bond throughout the game. It's also very clear from context clues that Noelle has a thing for Susie. Whether those feelings are reciprocated remains to be seen. The point of me highlighting this is to point out a specific component of Susie's character. Susie repays kindness with loyalty. When Noelle shares a pencil with Susie, she remembers that kindness, and in turn, does not mistreat her. We see another example of this when Chris saves Susie's life, and Susie defends Chris moments later. Susie's loyalty is one of her least known qualities within Universe. Most people understand her as someone to be feared. The other kids are afraid of her partly because of Susie's own affirmation. She failed to make friends, so she plays off of their fear to keep them at a distance. It's a defense mechanism, a way that she can feel safe from scorn or humiliation. She is the new girl after all. From what I've gathered, it actually seems like Susie's behavior is not unwarranted. While still inside the classroom in Chapter 1, Snowdrake tells you about this supposed saying which mocks Susie. You Suze, you lose. This piece of dialogue would actually support the idea that Susie did not figuratively throw the first punch. Snowdrake likes cracking jokes, so I would not be surprised that one day he made a joke regarding Susie, and in response, she took to threatening Snowdrake to get him to stop. This is not the morally correct response, but she's a child, she doesn't know any better. She most likely kept doing this because it worked. You can actually talk to Monster Kid in the epilogue of Chapter 1 in which he blatantly says that Susie never actually beat anyone up. The kids just assume she would because of how convincing Susie is. Monster Kid then recounts a time where Susie would just watch them as they would play a game of handball. Never interact or ask to join them, but just watch them play. The ball flew over to her feet, which she then proceeds to accidentally kick into Undyne's police cruiser. A very embarrassing moment for her and a failed attempt at joining the other kids while they were playing. Chris was never afraid of Susie, and I think the reason why is because they knew what we know now. Susie has always wanted to be a part of the group, have friends, share secrets, play handball, but it's just so damn hard talking to people. No really, what if they said no when I asked to join them? That would be terrible. Making friends is difficult, especially if you're the new kid. Perhaps at one point Susie did have friends. She does later reference going to a sleepover in the past. After everything we have gathered about Susie's past, I believe this is a classic case of moving to a new city. Susie most likely had friends where she came from, but they are all gone now. Because of familial issues, or financial hardship, or some other life-altering event, Susie was forced to move away from her old friends, and she might never see them again. The way I see it, Susie exhibits the most character growth in the short time she has been shown in the game thus far. When we meet Susie, she is rude, rash, and angry. But over the course of a few days, she not only decides to calm down, but also displays more of her virtuous characteristics. I hated Susie when I played Deltarune for the first time, and it took me about an hour for me to start warming up to her. But now, she's one of my favorites. Just going by her introductory scene, I am almost certain that you are meant to hate her in the beginning. The very first time we see Susie, she bluntly kicks open a door with so much force we can see the door bend. 
She walks in, and even though her face is completely covered, you would not be wrong to assume that something was bothering her. To break the silence, Susie asks if she is late to class. It is very clear that she is, but Alphys does not say as such. Alphys later mentions that the chalk is missing, and we find out later that Susie is the one who has been stealing it. For a moment, if you'll allow me to speculate a bit about Alphys, I actually believe she knows it's been Susie who's been stealing the chalk. She would never approach Susie directly with this, most likely out of fear. But if you look at the cutscene, Alphys turns to look at Susie when she threatens disciplinary action on everyone in the class, to no avail. Also supporting this would be when Toriel mentions the chalk when talking to Chris about Susie. It's clear that Alphys and Toriel share candid conversations about their students during downtime. This could also be why Alphys sends Susie to the supply closet to go find some chalk. This is Alphys giving Susie a chance to change her mind and find the chalk. Alphys sends Chris out of the class to make sure that Susie actually gets the chalk. You may not notice it at first, but the design parallels between Chris and Susie are very apparent. Not just with how their hair covers their face, but also in the way that they stand. Their posture. How they seem to be outsiders compared to the other kids in the class. Susie may be a monster unlike Chris, but similarly to Chris, she has a hard time making friends. Susie munches down on the chalk and turns to see Chris standing there, motionless. Susie is aware that Chris just saw her eat the chalk. Chris does not say anything in response, and Susie shares a secret about herself. Quiet people piss me off. She then proceeds to threaten Chris, stating that if she is going to finally be expelled, then maybe she should get expelled for a good reason. I think this scene has so much more context for us than we ever knew. On the surface level, we can tell from her speech that she has a history of acting up, so much so that she could be expelled at any moment. Of course, we know that Susie is just suffering from some kind of paranoia, as Alphys has no grudge against her whatsoever, and if she did find Susie eating the chalk, then Alphys would be more confused rather than angry. From Susie's thought process, we can tell this paranoia includes everyone, as she thinks that everyone wants to get rid of her. This only reinforces the idea that Susie sees herself as a burden, or not wanted. None of the teachers and most of the students didn't initially feel this way, but the damage has already been done. What really strikes me is her reasoning. Susie is trying to scare Chris into not telling Alphys about the missing chalk, so if anything is certain, Susie does not want to be expelled. Expulsion would mean potential punishment, ridicule from her parents, and more exposure to her home life in general. You'll notice an interesting reasoning for wanting to bite Chris's head off, as in, she wants her reason for being expelled to be an exceptionally bad one. Just think from her perspective. Getting expelled means your parents are going to be mad at you. If the reason is gruesome and terrifying enough, then maybe her parents will begin to fear her as well. This interpretation does go under the assumption that Susie is actually contemplating murdering Chris right here and now, which ultimately I doubt is actually the case, mostly because Susie puts Chris down soon after citing that Chris's passing would make Toriel upset. Susie, at this stage, does not harm people unless she deems it necessary, and we soon learn the limits of that threshold. Further down the hall, the supply closet door opens and takes both Chris and Susie by surprise. This event throws Susie off her bully persona briefly, and begins a trend for her throughout most of chapter 1. There is no nice way of saying this, but Susie is a big scaredy cat, specifically chapter 1 Susie. The door flying open and most of the hallway becoming engulfed in total darkness would give anyone pause, but this isn't the only instance of Susie losing her nerve. When Susie finds herself inside the dark world, we find her hiding. Sure, she tries to maintain her tough monster act, but it's clear that Susie is afraid. Make no mistake, these are very traumatic events taking place that would instill a sense of fear into anyone, but Susie constantly puts up this front that she is not afraid when in fact, she is. Later, while fighting the K-Round, Rousey pleads with Susie to stop attacking and help them resolve the fight peacefully, but Susie ignores this to maintain the perception that she is not afraid. Fear is an emotion that inhabits every aspect of Susie's life. She is afraid to ask for help. She is afraid to make friends and talk to people. She is afraid that everyone is against her. She is afraid to share her feelings. She can try to hide her feelings from the people around her with different levels of success, but she can't hide herself from us. Susie is afraid. 
I am not highlighting all of this to poke fun or to make Susie seem shallow. I just want everyone to understand this going forward because most of Susie's actions throughout chapter 1 are fueled by her fears. Understanding this will help us understand why Susie does what she does. Let's move on. Jumping to the point where Susie and Chris escape Lancer's initial ambush, they happen across the Kingdom of Darkness. Rousey explains the prophecy, or he doesn't, depending on what you select. Lancer attacks again. Lancer proclaims that he is there to thrash them, and Susie's criteria for inflicting harm is met. When Lancer retreats, Rousey reaffirms the two are heroes of prophecy, and they must help him seal the Dark Fountain. Susie completely denies any inclination that she is heroic. She claims that Rousey has the wrong person, and the fate of the world is none of her business. This response is to be expected. Like I said, Susie is afraid, in more ways than one. Her fears manifest in her violent actions towards Lancer, and any other Dark World denizen unfortunate enough to cross paths with her. I would say more so than anything, Susie is afraid of the responsibility or praise that comes with a prophecy like this. You've got the wrong person. In Susie's eyes, she can never be a hero like the ones in Dragon Blazers 2. She hears the inhibiting voice in her head telling her she isn't good enough to save people, so to avoid developing the conversation, she removes herself, stating that it's none of her damn business. Susie's impatience is only rivaled by her body count. Anyone who gets in her way is promptly thrashed. Yes, this aggressive trend is meant to imply that Susie is a violent person, but I would actually imply that Susie is justified for a portion of these thrashings. Now the cake? That's not defensible. That was theft, plain and simple. But the thrashing of the Darkners could have very well been self-defense. Most of the Darkners are found in groups of three. Even the ones you face with Rousey don't care about a fair fight. Also, at this stage in the game, the Darkners, while mostly open to the idea of not fighting, have their orders to attack any Lightners they come across. To Chris and Rousey, these enemies are easily swayed by brief enticement, but from Susie's perspective, any attack made against her, regardless of magnitude, means that all bets are off. It's time to catch the smoke, and catch the smoke they did. When talking to these Dark World denizens, you hear their explanation of how they were just following orders from their king. Calmer minds would have prevailed, but Susie is a long ways away from having a calm mind. We find later that Susie has skirmished her way through everyone who crossed her path along with any hazardous obstacles as well. It should be noted that the puzzle that Susie almost impaled herself upon while brute forcing her way through was specifically designed to be solved by two or more people. She never would have been able to solve the puzzle by herself, and instead of waiting, she chooses a path of harm rather than patience. Susie is an impatient person, yes. But is it really to the effect that she would hurt herself just to save some time? I honestly don't think so. I think that Susie felt that she had to push through this puzzle. I'll explain why in just a moment. Susie eventually makes her way to a door bearing the Deltarune logo. Judging by the large crack affixed to the door's right side, it would appear that she has made several attempts to brute force her way through this challenge as well. Again, choosing the more painful and abrasive option to progress. Well, I think I've seen enough. In conclusion, Susie is a rash, angry monster who mindlessly kicks anyone in her way. Angels heaven help anyone who walk into the general vicinity of Suzella the Violent Tormentor. This is what I would have said if I didn't take the time to break down Susie's motivations. Remember when I said Susie is afraid? Well, let me see if I can offer you a new perspective to the events I just recapped. You start your day at your regular school. It's filled with people who hate you, but it's better than the alternative. You make your way to the supply closet, and after walking inside, the door shuts behind you abruptly. Then, if that wasn't scary enough, the ground underneath you crumbles and you fall down a massive chasm. Dizzy and lost, you walk through this dark and disgusting place when it's only you and these weird floppy things. You hear something walking towards you, so you hide out of fear. Moments later, you are attacked by a strange shadowy figure, and you proceed to run for your life. You find shelter in this very strange looking castle, and the only person there creepily knows your name. And then they proceed to tell you this big grandiose story, as if this whole situation was just a game. 
This random guy then asks you to be this big hero and to save the world, even though he hasn't even shown you his face. You're not interested in whatever game this weirdo is playing, and you just want to go home. Right before you leave, you are attacked a second time by the same person. All you had to eat today was some dry chalk, and here is this chef just sleeping instead of eating this delicious cake that he made. So you help yourself to some. After all that, for the third time you are attacked by this lancer guy and his assortment of goons. They completely outnumber you, but you're tough enough to win anyway. Under the impression that you will be attacked again, you continue east, until a spike puzzle impedes your progress. You can't solve the puzzle no matter how hard you try, and you know those goons are right behind you, so you choose to push your way through the spikes, no matter how much they hurt. Again, you stop because there is a random door blocking your way, and you know you can't go back because of the spikes, so all you can really do is punch the door as hard as you can, as you desperately just try to get home. Then, the random guy and your classmate finally catch up with you, and all of a sudden, you are the person who is in the wrong, and you need to start resolving your problems more peacefully. You may think I am inventing things in my head, that I am changing how the story goes to fit my own narrative. I would implore you to realize that this is the recounting of events from Susie's perspective. There are no bad guys in this situation. There are just people acting to their own benefit, and most of the time, their motivations oppose each other. Yes, Chris and Rousey have the benefit of context given to them by already defeated enemies. But Susie most likely never got that context because she was too busy defending herself from potential three-on-one engagements. Susie is a child, a child with a difficult life. It would be unrealistic and unreasonable to expect Susie to engage in pragmatism after this situation is thrust upon her. Seriously, be honest with yourself. Out of Susie, Rouse, and Chris in Chapter 1, who reacts the most realistically to the events that transpire? Yeah, exactly, it's Susie. She was just having a normal day, attending her normal school, when the ground decided to literally crumble beneath her. She didn't ask for this to happen to her. She didn't want this. She already has enough on her plate right now, and how dare anyone ask Susie to do anything beneficial for the world after how badly the world has treated her. Susie did nothing wrong. Fight me. Okay, mini rant over. Now, to be real for a second, yes, Susie did steal the chef's cake, and I did make assumptions about how many darkners attacked Susie, but I would say the evidence we have within the game supports this context. I am not saying that Susie is morally correct with her murder hobo strategy, but she definitely thought what she was doing was correct at the time. This is endorsed by how Susie acts insulted when Rousey eventually criticizes her. She claims that K-Round was vicious, which is her way of justifying attacking it. Susie is sternly under the impression that K-Round is trying to attack her, and this reaction from Susie has me very intrigued. In the first K-Round encounter, they look about as sweet as possible. Huge smile, skipping their feet. The way I see it, this enemy is easier to spare than Whimsum from Undertale. And yet Susie is under the impression that it is vicious and trying to attack her, so Susie attacks it. This has me thinking whether or not Susie is suffering from alexithymia, or the difficulty of expressing or identifying emotions. Alexithymia is not a defined mental disorder, but instead is a classification for people who have trouble practicing introspection and who struggle with relaying to other people how they are feeling. We may think that identifying emotions is easy, but there is a large percentage of the population that has trouble doing it. Luckily, Susie is about to experience something to increase her emotional palate. I am of course referring to the conversation between Susie and Lancer, which ultimately concludes in a positive misunderstanding. The personalities of Lancer and Susie are in opposition to each other, and this isn't just because they are on two different sides of a war. Susie is non-indulgent, specifically working towards her goal of leaving the Dark World. Everything about Lancer is eccentric, overblown, and dare I say, whimsical. When talking about personality, they are almost polar opposites. 
Lancer is clearly taking this bad guy business and the war against the Lightners with exuberance. However, he is making the mistake of getting in Susie's way. Irate and past her limit of patience, Susie sees all of Lancer's antics as benign posturing. Susie doesn't even bother attacking Lancer because she would rather attempt an intimidation strategy instead. I would like to take a second to point out that this is moments after Rousey asks Susie to stop fighting enemies and to try and resolve conflicts peacefully. I would like to think that Susie is making an attempt here to go along with what Rousey said, just in her own way. But I could see also that Susie is doing this on the grounds of making a point. Let's talk about Susie's reasoning with becoming upset with Lancer. Sure, he is wasting her time and is about to send more people to attack, but what I really think is to be analyzed here is when she says, wannabe tough guys like you really piss me off. It seems as though the idea of posturing and attempting to make people believe you are tough is something that makes Susie especially upset. I believe the reason why Susie became so insulted by Lancer is because it's reminding her of an actual time where she was intimidated, when Susie was unironically afraid of Lancer, when she first entered the Dark World. Susie knows how to intimidate people. It's probably a trait she learned from someone else or through practice, but here comes this ball of jello thinking he's a badass. Susie was already at odds with Lancer because he was the first to attack her, but I would imagine if anything, this is a direct parallel to the Chris scene. Susie doesn't want Chris to tell on her, so she intimidates. Susie wants Lancer to leave her alone, and we almost have a confirmed pattern. This doesn't work to the effect that Susie wanted it to, but for a moment her intimidating facade drops and confusion takes over. Uncertain how to process the situation, Susie settles for the fact that Lancer has left, and she can go back to knocking heads. This specific moment is the genesis of Susie's transformation. Later we get to see Susie's thought process when it comes to tackling puzzles firsthand. She sees the puzzle, gets discouraged, and then proceeds to try to brute force her way through it. Susie mentions how she was a box for Halloween, only highlighting even more how her options for taking part in regular activities were limited. Chris solves the puzzle and they move on. The next time they meet Lancer, his motivation to impress Susie is very apparent. He acts like Susie, laughs like Susie, and he even asks for notes afterwards. This takes Susie aback initially, but begins a spark of emotion that Susie hasn't felt before. Susie feels appreciated. She feels like her opinion has inherent value because someone is showing genuine interest in her opinion. This is potentially the first piece of positive reinforcement Susie has received for a very long time. Definitely more of a positive boost than she ever had when fighting with Chris and Rousey. This would later lead to Susie's betrayal in a few minutes, which we'll get to in a moment. Let's talk about Susie's chosen name for the Lightners. The Squad. Really, I can't discern anything from this crude choice other than Susie's disinterest in coming up with a name and acting non-compliant. Rebelling to the idea of being part of a group by making the group name something profane. Not much to point out here, but hey, I can't meticulously break down every single cutscene now, can I? Probably not, but you're damn sure I'm gonna try. After everything we talked about, the recounting of events from Susie's perspective, and how Susie's actions and methods were being criticized or ignored, I think at this point it is very clear why Susie makes the decision to join Lancer. Lancer was not only the first person to show interest in her, he also idolized her and complimented her in a way she appreciated. Rousey was morally correct to explain to her that it was wrong to attack people indiscriminately. But to Susie, she did the right thing and Rousey is in the wrong. Susie makes the choice to fight for the side she was trying to get away from because now she feels appreciated. This is actually a very interesting turn of events. Susie treats Chris and Rousey like they are goody-goodies who make friends with their enemies, but she fails to realize that Lancer has done the exact same thing to her, accidentally. She goes along with Lancer willingly because it was her idea. Rousey mentions how maybe he was wrong to treat Susie the way he did. Rousey was nice and endearing, but that's not really what Susie needed. We understand more of Rousey's perspective during the Acid Tunnel of Love in Chapter 2, but I'm getting off track again. 
I think it's best to sum up the actions of the Dark Fun Gang as mischievous at best. They scheme, they conspire, but they never do anything harmful until they demand that Rousey and Chris join them. It is more than obvious that Susie doesn't care about sides or even getting home at this point. Susie just wants companionship. Even when she fights you, she's not trying to win or prove she's better, she just wants you two to join her. It's literally like two friend groups playing pretend and one side wants to play pirates and the other side wants to play spacemen and they have to fight to see which group joins the other. The only way to progress is by winning, so after you manage to beat them, Lancer and Susie join the team. While making their approach to the card castle, the gang spots a candy tree. The actual event of Susie giving Lancer the candy despite mentioning she was hungry earlier isn't the most important part of the scene, but rather what comes later. Lancer, being more outgoing and open to sharing than Susie is, makes the statement that just the act of walking with the Lightners makes him feel happy. Rousey explains that the purpose of the Darkners is to assist the Lightners. Susie prefers to avoid talking about purpose, but even so, she admits that she feels the same. Susie doesn't like talking about purpose. Purpose. A person's sense of resolve or determination. The combination of your confidence and your ideals, which encourage your decisions. Susie hates puzzles, so naturally she would hate thinking in general. Why would she ever have to think about her future when, in her own eyes, she has no future? She has no purpose. You usually get this from people who are in high stress environments. The extra stress puts them into survival mode more often than not. When you're stuck in such a horrible living situation, it can be impossible to think about a better life. Moving on, living for a day where you wake up and feel safe. Why would Susie think about her life's purpose when she's so busy trying to see the next day? Whether she wants to admit it or not, today is the day Susie's life will change. The value Lancer saw within her, just by being who she is, sparked a feeling of appreciation. She won't let go of that easy. Lancer calls her a good friend, and she can't help but smile. She finally has what she wanted for so long. Something happens, however. People crave companionship, but they are also individuals with their own motivations. Lancer was sent here to kill Susie, and failed miserably. What will his father say? More alarmingly, what will Susie do when they reach the castle? Lancer has learned firsthand what Susie does to people who moderately annoy her. Lancer's father straight up wants to kill her. There is no winner in this scenario. Either way, Lancer loses someone he cares about. He knows he can't play both sides, so he attempts to take control of the game. Lancer runs away, and Susie is completely shocked. After experiencing complete shock from Lancer running away from her, Susie shows her fear once again. Just the sight of Lancer leaving without so much as an explanation makes her mind spin. She is afraid that her one and only friend is leaving her. She feels the fear she felt every day before she came to the Dark World. After spending so much time with Lancer, she is imagining a world without them being friends, and it terrifies her. Only moments before we get to see Susie's climactic character moment, she comes to a puzzle. She can't go back and ask Chris for help, so she has to solve it herself. The vague sound of Lancer's voice is what encourages her to push through the puzzle. Spending time with Lancer has allowed her to think about life more, not always worrying about what people thought of her. She solves her first puzzle and proceeds to find Lancer close by, advocating for Susie's continued incarceration. Completely oblivious to what Lancer's plan is, she petitions for the release of Chris and Rousey. Lancer's plan has failed him, but the die is cast. He can't uncapture Susie, and now everything about his actions would imply that his actions were malicious. Lancer tries to explain, but it's too late. Susie is afraid. Afraid to give herself more credit afraid to think that this was all a big misunderstanding. To protect herself, she regresses back into her bully persona. There is no reaching her at this point. She's angry. She's upset, and most of all, she's hurt. She orders Lancer to get out of the way. He refuses. She commands again with more force, but Lancer stands his ground. Susie doesn't have time for this, and unfortunately, 
Lancer made the mistake of getting in her way. It's time for Lancer to die. With every swing of her axe, Susie's attacks get stronger. With every strike, Lancer appears to become weaker and weaker, refusing to fight back. Susie notices and pretends she is unfazed. She insults Lancer, absolves herself of responsibility, labels Lancer as a traitor, and still, he refuses to fight. Susie is taken aback, but she continues to strike. She exhausts every single trick in her playbook, every single tactic she has used in the past to push people away. They all fail. Susie gives Lancer one final chance to turn tail and run, but his resolve remains. Susie's rage is at its highest peak, and then suddenly, it stops. Susie is not a killer. She said it herself. She doesn't want it to end like this. She collapses to the ground, defeated, even though she took lesser of the beating. Everything Susie has done has been because she was afraid. She was afraid she wasn't good enough to be cared about. She was afraid for her life. She was afraid of losing her first friend. And even now, when she believes that her friend betrayed her, she is afraid to kill him. Lancer takes this opportunity to explain the misunderstanding. In his own backwards logic, he was trying to capture Susie in hopes to keep her safe. When this is explained, Susie pauses and turns away. The pixel art doesn't really do the scene justice, because I would imagine if we could see the look on Susie's face, it would be one of relief that her friend still cares about her, then followed by terror over the idea of what she could have done if she had not stopped herself. And finally, the dread, because she has no idea what to do now. Well, she knows what she has to do, but she does not have the skill set to achieve this. Lancer would not want to see his father injured, so Susie must now find a way to get past him without doing so. She has to embrace this idea that she has spent the past hour or so making fun of Rousey for taking part in. Susie makes her way to Rousey and Chris, and the gang makes their way to the elevator. Long awkward elevator rides are prime real estate for having character building conversations, and we see just that. Susie requests that Rousey show her how to act, rather than fight her way through the card castle. Rousey is more than willing to help, but he demands that Susie takes the first steps towards being nice. Susie, begrudgingly, agrees to stop hazing Rousey in return for a cake and some kindness lessons. Before you have a chance to leave the elevator, Susie stops Chris. Susie admits that the only way to succeed is by working together. While working with Lancer as part of the Dark Fun Gang, Susie realized that life doesn't have to be so bad if you have people working with you. Susie had a taste of what life could be like if you had friends, and I don't think she's planning on giving that up anytime soon. From here on, Susie will listen to your inputs from Chris. She will allow you to tell her what to do because, for now, she trusts you. Learning to play nice proves a more difficult task for Susie than others. When Susie is prompted to compliment an enemy, she responds with the phrase, What good can I say about someone trying to kill us? And I have to say, that is a very fair question. What really strikes me is the dialogue that comes from Susie's attempt to be nice. There's actually more than one dialogues when you ask Susie to compliment an enemy. Of course, we all know about the coveted you are unbanned from free ham sandwich day, but there are two other dialogue options that I found. The sandwich one is obvious, as one could envision Susie attempting to attend said free ham sandwich day, only to eat so many ham sandwiches that she had to be banned. One of many, many times Susie is referenced to be hungry or unable to afford food for herself. The others are a little bit more interesting. When talking about all of these dialogue options, it is important to note, these are things that Susie wishes someone would say to her. One of these responses is, your outfit doesn't look disgusting. Susie's outfit in the light world has been shown to be worn, and it's obvious to her, most of all, that her clothes are in bad condition. Deep down, I think Susie cares about that sort of thing. I'm not saying that Susie has a deeply repressed girly girl side, I am saying that she wishes she had more comfortable clothes to wear. It's hard to tell based purely on the sprite, but by the looks of things, the pants she wears hang over her shoes, which could very well imply that they are hand-me-downs. 
This insecurity about her outfit either stems from her own subconscious in how she thinks that people believe negative things about her, or it's an idea that was placed into her head by someone else. The third dialogue option is, Nice, you guys look like you're gonna kill me. The way I see it, this line could mean one of two things. Either number one, Susie is being sarcastic, which could very well be the case, or Susie has her own set of insecurities about how tough she is. She wants to be perceived as tough. The idea that the person she is talking to would not want to fight her because they are afraid supports her defense mechanism. Susie actively threatens people and sometimes hurts them to affirm that she is not to be messed with. This distancing strategy makes her feel safe. Keep everyone afraid and at arm's length so they won't hurt you in the future. The vindication Susie would get from this compliment would embolden her old self. Everything that Susie has done up until this moment has been fueled by her fears. Susie must change. The world has presented a series of circumstances that contradict everything that she previously believed. Of course, I'm talking about the Spade King, who, by some unseen previous history or some ideology that was implanted by the Knight, he hates Lightners with a passion. He proclaims that he is the bad guy and that the very existence of the Lightners goes against his own. The Fun Gang and Lancer approach with every intention of avoiding a confrontation. Despite their best efforts, the conversation breaks when the king begins to use his own son as leverage. Regardless of how they wanted to handle things, the Spade King forces their hand. They must now wait for the Spade King to tire himself out or fight him. Either way, the Spade King collapses and is unable to continue fighting. Rouse heals him and the king attacks when everyone is off guard. Before, Susie had a very clear view of Chris Dreamer in her head. The quiet freak who doesn't say anything but is always thinking something about you in their head. Chris Dreamer, the quiet kid who has it out for me and would love to see me get expelled. The very same Chris Dreamer who, hours ago, I was threatening to murder, just jumped in front of an attack to save me. Like I previously stated, Susie values loyalty. If you do right by her, she will follow suit. No matter the effect, no matter the reason, the way Susie sees this, Chris values her life. Chris is her friend, and she will protect her friends. The day is won, and everyone learns a valuable lesson. They learn to compromise. Yes, this world is filled with people who would hurt you, and those who would put themselves into harm's way to keep you safe. Sometimes you have to fight, but if you only ever fight, you can end up hurting the wrong person. Susie understands this now. Before, she was afraid. Now, that fear has washed away, because she knows that no matter whatever the world will throw at her, she has people in her life that will face it with her. She isn't afraid to talk about how she feels. She isn't afraid to care about people. Susie isn't afraid anymore. Before we move on to chapter 2, we have a couple of side bits to get rid of. A bunch of small pieces of info that I didn't really have any strong explanations for. Most of these topics are either vague, or we don't have enough pieces to draw firm conclusions yet. For starters, what's up with Susie's axe? The description says it was formed from the mane of a dragon whelp. This would mean that the axe literally came from the hair of a baby dragon. So is it like a hair clip? If it is a hair clip, then why does Susie keep it inside her pocket rather than use it to hold up her hair? I'm just assuming it's a hair clip by the way, and I'm not really sure if it is. The description is sort of vague, and it would also support it being a piece of hair itself. I honestly have no idea why Susie doesn't allow you to re-equip it after it's been unequipped. If there is even a reason. Another random plot point that I honestly don't understand fully is that why does Susie fall asleep so quickly after listening to Rousey's song? The song works on the pawns as well, and from what I can tell, the effects are mechanical. But with everything we know about Toby Fox, there is more likely an alternate reason why Susie falls asleep to this song. Maybe she was sung to sleep when she was little, maybe she's just tired in general, I don't know. Nothing except for ideas, really. Things I noticed that seemed intentional, but I don't have enough pieces to say that they are mean something important. Anyway, moving on. Begin chapter 2, and for a change, Susie made it to class before Chris, clearly excited to return to the Dark World. 
Susie greets Chris as they exit the classroom with a jab, referring to them as the class zombie. Susie is less hostile to Chris at this stage, but old habits die hard. What I really think is intriguing is Susie's fixation with returning to the dark world. Susie is not oblivious to the dangers within, and regardless of these dangers, she still enjoys the dark world compared to the light. There is a more meta conversation to be had here regarding the concept of fictional worlds. Pre chapter 2, the running theory for Deltarune was that the dark worlds were simply a make-believe story that Chris was playing for Susie, so she can work through her emotional trauma. We know now that everything within the dark world is real, including the threat of pain and seizure. Susie is willing to take these risks as long as she gets to have more fun adventures with her friends. As real as the danger is, Susie is happy to get lost in this fantasy world because for one, it's an escape. A reprieve from her normal life which most likely has more unnecessary stress than other people would have. Right before they enter the dark world, Noelle shows up. She asks Susie and Chris to come by the library to do some studying for their project. As soon as Noelle leaves, Susie is completely confused why Noelle would ask her to help her with her homework. Susie assumes that Noelle is simply on to their secret identities. This assumption is a clear example of how her inhibitions are still affecting her. Like I said, old habits die hard. Right before entering the dark world, Susie has pause. She begins to ask Chris a question under the idea that the dark world might not be there when they open the door. She trails off before finishing, but I think it's clear she is worried that without the dark world for them to share, would they still have a reason to spend time together? It's not a strange fear for Susie to have. After all, the two Lighteners were at odds only yesterday. Upon entering the Dark World, Chris and Susie meet up with Rousey again, and they find out that Rousey has taken the liberty to make custom rooms for both of them. When entering Chris's room, the first thing you'll notice is their bed, and how colorful the sheets are compared to the regular room. This could be a representation of how Chris would love to be able to express themselves with decor in their own personal space, but never was able to do so because of their inability to speak their mind. When checking the bed, it describes as like sleeping on a dream, a soft place for Chris to rest their head, a place far from the distressing family problems they have to live with in their normal life. There are obvious parallels to Azrael's side of the room compared to Chris, many trophies celebrating many impressive accomplishments, a shelf for Chris to put all of their memorable keepsakes, and a closet full of clothes so they can wear whatever they want. Perhaps this means that Chris wishes they were more like Asriel. People who don't talk are often perceived as weak. This could invoke both negative and positive reactions from the people around you. Your family may discourage you from trying to push yourself because they think you're delicate, and nefarious people around you could see you as an easy target because of the same perceived fragility. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy that can only be brute forced through by your own actions. You have to show the people around you that you are capable. Maybe that's why Chris is opening up the dark worlds on their own. They want the challenge. Now let's talk about Susie's room. What is the most striking feature of Susie's room is the sheer amount of spikes and edges. In noticing this decoration choice, I recall that these rooms were made by Rousey and therefore are a reflection of how he sees his two best friends, rather than a direct result of their personalities. Rousey made these rooms, so this is what Rousey thinks they would want in their rooms, which is very interesting when you take into account how Chris's room is set up, but we'll talk about all of that in Rousey's video. I actually just thought of something that's pretty funny if it's true. What if the reason why the clothes in Susie's dresser are fighting is because that's what Rousey thinks happened? Susie's clothes are ripped, right? So what if Rousey came up with the idea that Susie's clothes fight each other and that's why they are ripped. If that is the actual reason, then holy crap, Toby, you are hilarious and a genius at the same time. <laughs> that would be so adorable if Rousey thought that that was the reason. Really, what sews this scene together is Susie's reaction to looking at her room. Susie expresses gratitude for the gift, and they move on. Later on, when Chris and Susie enter the library, the door to the computer lab opens, Susie naturally interprets the situation and looks forward to the next big adventure that awaits them. When the group happens across Noelle and sees her whisked away inside a cage, Susie springs into action. 
She interrogates Queen for the reason of Noelle's capture and demands her release. Susie is still fearful, but now she's afraid for the well-being of other people. She is now fueled by the pursuit of the well-being of her friends, a skill that will come in handy a little later. Susie sees that Chris cannot use the game controls properly, and she springs an idea. Susie grabs hold of Chris's arms, and wherever their hands move, she will move them, physically and figuratively offering her support to Chris, and their desired course of action by using her actions, truly filling in her role as the muscle of the group. Even in the early stages of Chapter 2, we can see how much Susie has changed, from her desire to help Noelle, to the formulation of ideas to work together as a group. It's very clear that Susie has changed a lot. For this next part, I'm aware that I never did this for the Chris video, I feel like it's a missed opportunity, so I'll do it now. When Sweet, Cap, and KK start a fight with the Fun Gang, the only way to beat them is through dancing all at once. I'm not going to focus too much on the fact that Susie begins to act on her own and shows Rousey how to do the same, as Susie's new confidence and her straightforward personality are explanations for this event. What I really want to analyze is the specific choice of dance assigned to the Lightners. Each dance is taken from the Peanuts Christmas special, something Toby most likely watched as a kid. And yes, I understand that it's a reference. In the Chris video, I decided to analyze why Chris would throw up a peace sign for one of the picture options, and a lot of you pointed out that it was a reference to Earthbound. However, I wonder if Rousey eventually figured out that it was an Earthbound reference, because he was really confused for a while. No, no, seriously, I get that it's a reference, but that's not how analysis works. <laughs> Just because something is a reference to something else, doesn't mean you can't analyze it at face value. I honestly don't think Toby assumes that everyone who plays Deltarune had already played Earthbound. Much like I'm pretty sure Toby doesn't already expect everyone to have watched the Peanuts Christmas special. This is happening in the story, I know it's a reference, however there is a specific reason why Toby chose for this to happen. So I am going to analyze it for that very reason. Let's talk about Susie's chosen dance. Susie's dance is taken directly from the character Linus. To be honest, I know very little about the Peanuts cartoon and the comic strip it was based on. I was shown some of the movies when I was younger, but I don't really remember them a whole lot. So I kind of had to do a little bit of research to find out what kind of character Linus is. The focal point of Linus's character is his attachment to his safety blanket. This is natural child behavior, to grow attachment to a specific object that brings you comfort. But the thing is, Susie doesn't have a safety blanket. Or does she? You could say her old way of interacting with people was her safety blanket. Violence could have been her safety blanket, as funny as that sounds. Think about it, it's something she defaulted to because it made her feel safe and secure. She used violence to keep other people at a distance, and by doing so, she was able to maintain a sense of control. If not that, then I would assume that the physical equivalent to a safety blanket would be her jacket. Briefly jumping ahead, during the cutscene after the Spamton boss fight, Chris turns to Susie and asks for her jacket, but she refuses to part with it. Maybe Susie's safety blanket is her jacket? Maybe it was given to her? Maybe it's important to her for some reason? Or perhaps she likes to wear it because it hides her tail? Jackets are a very comfortable piece of clothing, and they do typically hide most of your physical features. Perhaps she uses her jacket to hide her physical features that she's upset about. She does act embarrassed when people notice her tail. You see how fun and interesting it can be to overanalyze a game about an angry purple dinosaur? That's the reason I analyze things at all. It can take you down a thought process to help you get a clear perspective on one of your favorite characters. I'm not going to go over the Chris and Rousey dances, but if you really want me to, just let me know, and I'll do them in the Rousey video. Let's move on for now. Further down the line, we get to the trash land. The gang finds themselves in a massive pile of junk after their fight with Birdly. Chris and Rousey make it out fine, but Susie, in her jest, injures her angle on the way down. She is clearly hurt, but refuses to show any kind of weakness. Rousey, being the lovable cinnamon bun, walks over to her and gives her a nice big hug, healing her in the process. Susie is quick to try and deny Rousey's affectionate act, but can't deny how useful his healing ability really is. Susie questions Rousey how he is able to use that kind of magic, which then prompts him to offer to give Susie lessons. 
This is most likely the reason why Susie grabs Rousey's hand and runs off with him. Susie wants to learn healing powers from Rousey, but the main question is, why? I think there are several reasons why Susie would want this power. Maybe she thinks it could help Noelle if she gets hurt. Maybe she wants it for the sake of her friends in general. Maybe for a change she wants to feel like she is helping someone rather than hurting them. Susie received a warm fuzzy feeling when she realized she helped Lancer, so maybe she likes that feeling. The feeling you get when you acted upon the world and thus made it a better place. Susie's confidence has grown tremendously since she started making friends. Friends have a way of doing that. Seemingly, the person who gives Susie the most confidence is Lancer. It's clear that he looks to her for support, and it's also clear that she embraces this role as a mentor to Lancer. Later on, after they are captured, her mood immediately improves when Lancer forms out of Chris's pocket, and it immediately falls back down when she realizes something is wrong with Lancer. Susie attempts to heal Lancer, but to no avail. The situation is dire. The group is under the impression that Rousey is being held captive, and potentially being abused, causing him to scream. For Susie, this is a very high stressful situation. One of her friends is potentially in danger, and her other friend is sick and fading away fast. But she maintains her tenacity. She becomes a leader and pushes the group forward. Birdly attempts to tag along, still feeling sour about Queen's recent betrayal. Susie is adverse to Birdly's company, but she has no time to argue. The group presses on. They travel down the hall and find themselves faced with multiple orientation puzzles. With each puzzle solved, Birdly becomes more and more frustrated as how Chris could have solved the puzzle without his help. After the second puzzle, Birdly demands the group wait for him to solve the next one by himself. Susie doesn't care enough about Birdly's pride to calm him down, or to comply, as also time is of the essence. Birdly is having trouble with the last puzzle because all of the pieces don't fit within the square. Without missing a beat, Susie is able to understand the solution to the puzzle. I just can't help but feel proud about how far Susie has come in the past couple of days. She's solving puzzles, carrying the group on her back, standing in as support for the group while Rousey is away. It's crazy to think that all she needed to stop her from threatening to bite people's heads off was just a little positive reinforcement. Susie boasts about her idea working and how she proved that Birdly isn't as smart as he thinks he is. Birdly agrees. There is a deeper analysis to be made when it comes to the codependency between Noelle and Birdly, but I'm going to save that for Noelle's video. We now get to the Ferris wheel ride. This scene does not push the overall narrative of the game forward, aside from developing the history between the two characters. Prior to chapter 1, Susie and Noelle had some semblance of a moment when Susie first came to class. Susie did not have a pencil, so to help her out, Noelle gave Susie one of her own. It was a small gesture, but despite this, Susie remembers it to this day. It's the main reason why Susie never bothered picking on Noelle, because she was nice to Susie at one point. This trend follows with everyone Susie has come to admire. Toriel, Noelle, Chris, Lancer. All of these characters simply because they were nice to her when she needed it. Realistically, this is a scene that I would rather go over in Noelle's eventual video for many reasons. Noelle's feelings towards Susie are pretty much confirmed at this point, and really the only thing about Susie to analyze character-wise is the fact that she lacks the emotional intelligence to understand that Noelle cares for her. So if anything, I guess we can go over that. Susie has come a very long way, but as we can see, she is still very self-conscious about her own image. This is most likely because of conditioning. Conditioning can happen when it's not intentional, as it is a byproduct of your surroundings. Noelle is very happy and outgoing because her father is the exact same. Susie is still reserved with her emotions most likely for a similar reason. The doubt and the inhibition is still present in Susie's mind, and I fear they will remain until she settles things with her own parents. The same inhibition which leads her to hiding her emotions. We see a physical representation of this when Susie becomes self-conscious about her tail. Susie is not an animal per se, but the wagging of an animal's tail can be a direct indicator of how they're feeling. After the conflict with Queen is resolved, Chris and Susie move on to the fountain. But before they seal it, Susie has a chance to voice her concerns about the night. Susie has adopted the opinion that the Dark Worlds are not as bad as Rousey makes them out to be. She has overall enjoyed her time in the Dark Worlds and whatever is going on in her normal life is either boring or too stressful compared to what is going on in the Dark World. 
really puts things into perspective when you think about it. Susie plays with the idea that the dark worlds can be a good thing and that they could be places where people can escape to. This idea really highlights a bigger issue that Susie will most likely have to face in the future. Lancer is a jack of spades playing card given life from the dark fountain. This is not a theory, this is 100% confirmed, plain as day. So I wonder what would happen if that playing card was just lost. What if that playing card, that specific one, made its way outside, and it was just blown away with the wind? And you know what that means, bye bye Lancer, forever. I wonder how Susie would react when she found out that her first true friend was a playing card. Would she take it well? Would she even believe it? What if Susie was faced with a choice to save the world or get rid of Lancer by sealing the final dark world in Castletown? I was initially going to talk about the Snowgrave route at the end of this section, but to not end this chapter on a sour note, I think I'll talk about it now. Throughout the Snowgrave route itself, there is seemingly no change with Susie's progression for the most part, considering that she is not seen throughout most of the route. The route mostly focuses on this version of Chris and Noelle, which means we will go very in-depth into the Snowgrave route in Noelle's video. Susie is completely unaware of what has transpired with Chris and Noelle in the small bit of time they were together. While Susie goes to check on Noelle, she exits the room after roughly a minute or so afterwards. The only explanation she gives is that she told Noelle that this was all a dream, and now Noelle feels better. Susie also appears to be more chipper and excited after exiting the room. She is reluctant to tell Rousey, but implies that she will tell Chris what happened later on. Unfortunately, she doesn't, so we can only assume what happened. One thing we can say for certain from this, though, is we can discern the different levels of friendship Susie holds Chris and Rousey to. She wouldn't trust Rousey with potential spicy gossip, but she would trust Chris. The boss fight with Queen does not happen, as she simply gives up. She isn't interested in bringing about the Roaring, so she refuses to fight the Lightners. They are about to leave when Susie offers her a way out. Susie extends the olive branch to allow Queen to come live within Castletown. An interesting proposal that I would normally expect from Rousey like he does in the regular route. But no, here is Susie making the call. Perhaps the good graces from Queen's intent is why Susie is more welcoming to her now than she was before. Aside from a few notable changes like talking to Rudy in the hospital, there are no more Susie changes within the Snowgrave route. Now let's talk about the regular timeline, where we will be covering Spamton's boss fight. I've already said why I omitted the Spamton fight analysis in Chris's video, and after realizing it was the wrong move, I will be taking the time to analyze the reactions of both Susie and Chris during and after the Spamton boss fight, here and now. Let's begin. The thematic through line for Spamton's story revolves around freedom. Freedom to do what you want, make your own deals, freedom to be who you want. The most universally accepted interpretation of Chris's reaction to the Spamton boss fight is that they feel like a puppet themselves, forced to be controlled by the player. Chris is shaken after the fight's conclusion because they are also afraid what their life would look like if they did not have the player deciding what to do at every moment. Spamton wanted freedom, and after talking to someone on the phone, he received the freedom he wanted. When he lost that freedom, he clamored, he crawled, and schemed to get it back. After the fight is concluded, Spamton loses his strings and falls to the floor. Unable to move, unable to make decisions without the help of his strings, he submits to his fate. Spamton gives up, and I think that this is what bothers Chris the most. Sure, Spamton gives some words of encouragement, telling Chris that they are strong and maybe they can break their own strings, but the fear remains. Now let's talk about Susie's reaction to the Spamton fight. From the moment Chris sets into motion the events that lead to the Spamton Neo fight, Susie is noticeably intrigued about what Chris is doing. If not concerned, she is definitely taken for pause. Susie more than likely withholds her own secrets from the group more often than not, so she doesn't see any reason to press the issue, at least for now. Chris rarely speaks, let alone pushes their friend's boundaries or prods at their secrets. And even though it's not openly said, I can't help but feel like Susie appreciates that kind of company. Spamton betrays Chris and is about to steal their soul until Susie and Rousey show up. Shaken by the sight of Chris almost dying to some weird puppet thing, Susie begins to question Chris. 
there is no time, unfortunately, and the fight commences. From Susie's perspective, it would be crazy not to ask questions at this point. Susie simply stops walking. She doesn't say anything, she doesn't get upset, she just stops. She is unable to find the words to start the conversation at first, so she simply refuses to follow you. Symbolically drawing a line she refuses to cross until she gets some semblance of an answer. I believe it is the surprise of the event, as well as the content of Spamton's speech, which makes Susie question what just happened. I have a feeling that this will be a repeating trend for the secret bosses going forward. Susie talks about the fact that Spamton just broke. She seems to be equally disturbed over what just happened. Even though she has zero context on Spamton, she still understands his feelings. Browse is quick to dismiss the entire situation, but Susie refused to choose ignorance. She notices that Chris has goosebumps. Quick science lesson, everyone. Goosebumps are a leftover trait from our evolution. We had fur all over our bodies. When they sensed danger, the fur on these creatures would stand up and get puffy in an attempt to make themselves look bigger. It's a defense mechanism that has stayed with us even in our more evolved state. The goosebumps remain and they still react similarly to when humans perceive danger. Chris is afraid of something, and Susie cares enough about them to now realize this. You have two options on how to respond when Susie asks if Chris is okay. If you say yes, Susie is far from convinced because Chris speaks in a strained voice. Susie presses the issue more, even asking Rouse to give his thoughts. Rouse is under the assumption that Chris is simply hungry, and he offers to make Chris something to eat later. Rouse also makes the assumption that Chris is simply cold and sees if Susie would give Chris her jacket. Susie refuses and instead warms Chris's heart with a joke. Susie has a special morbid flavor of comedy that Chris has been shown to value in the past. Chris laughed when Susie referenced biting into their head like an apple, and perhaps Susie used this past experience to find a way to make Chris smile again. It works, and for now it's good enough for her. Answering no causes Chris to scream out as if for the first time in a long time, they finally have the ability to speak their mind. Rouse at this point springs into action and attempts to calm Chris down as much as he can. Susie then takes more of a back seat with this response and adds the fact that Chris is lucky to be alive. The group moves on, shaken but somehow stronger for the experience. And finally we are getting to the point where this chapter is coming to a close. After a long day of adventures, laughs, character building, and memes, the two Lightners decide to pack it in for the night. Susie is about to leave when Toriel walks outside to meet them. She offers to let Susie stick around for a while longer, and she can show Susie how to make a pie. From the get-go, Susie's disposition is cherry. She is afraid to make any sudden move or to give off any unsavory impression to Toriel. Susie is actually based on someone from Toby Fox's life. There was this bully at his school who knew his mother and said that they would beat Toby up if his mother wasn't nice to them. I would use this piece of knowledge to better understand Susie, but I don't really think the real world example really relates too well. Susie does reference Toriel and the two known events where Susie bullied Chris, but she never demands that Toriel be nice to her. Susie makes an attempt to threaten Chris. When Susie is unsuccessful, she takes a more direct approach and she digs in a way that in her mind is the worst thing possible she could have said. She implies that one day Toriel would get tired of Chris, which is what Susie believes will finally get the reaction she wants. In Susie's mind, the worst thing that can happen to you is that your mother abandons you and removes you from her life. We can only assume that Susie believes this because it has already happened to her or she is afraid that it will happen in the near future. If Susie's mother already abandoned her, this means that she would be homeless or with her father. This would lead us to two very similar possibilities. Either the father blames Susie for the mother leaving, or the mother remains but blames Susie for the father leaving. Either way, I would say with confidence that Susie values Toriel's opinion. Susie is surprised that Toriel remembers her, implying that they had met before. Maybe at one point Susie was lost and confused about where she was going inside the school and Toriel showed her where the classroom was. Perhaps Toriel taught Susie in the past. Susie remembers when people show her kindness and Toriel is nice to almost everyone so we don't have to think too hard to envision this happening. The other interpretation is a little more funny and something I could equally envision happening. 
Think about the way that Susie acts in Alphys' classroom. And now think about what would happen if Alphys was swapped with Toriel. Toriel is a sweet and caring person, but she doesn't take back talk from anyone. I could absolutely imagine a scenario in the past where Susie is acting up and Toriel gave her the unbeatable Toriel scorn face. And ever since then, I wouldn't be surprised if Susie was a little afraid of Toriel to some degree. And that's why she's so frigid when she walks inside Toriel's house. Toriel is the only person Susie calls ma'am, and I don't think she is showing that kind of respect because Susie thinks highly of her. All that being said, I think the short moment of bonding between Susie and Toriel is very nice. They actually get along really well despite their different personalities. Granted, Susie isn't fully comfortable speaking her mind yet. They get along so well that I kind of start to feel bad for Chris. Admittedly, we are getting a very narrow view of what Chris and Toriel's conversations would be like, but I just can't envision that Chris and Toriel would ever have a conversation like this. Toriel says it would be a better idea if Susie spent the night and had a sleepover. Susie agrees to call her parents and makes her way over to the phone, only to then not call her parents and sit on the couch instead. The implications of this detail are actually very vast, but for the most part I see only three major potential explanations for this. Either number one, Susie's parents don't care where she is so she doesn't even bother calling them. Number two, Susie's parents don't have a phone. Or number three, Susie doesn't have parents at all. Chris, being the quiet person they are, does not question Susie about this, so we're just going to have to wait for the answer. Susie poses the idea that they should try to let the darkness come into the light world. Ever since Susie began exploring the dark worlds, she has grown to trust people, help people, teach people, but it's clear to her that that kind of support is needed in the light world as well. Her newfound zeal and cheer has manifested with the help of her friends, and she now wishes to have that same level of confidence in the light world. The deeper underlying interpretation is that the previously mentioned zeal leaves her when she isn't with her friends. I gush and applaud the progress Susie has made, but the real process of recovering from trauma can't truly begin unless the trauma source is removed. Susie is either still homeless or is still in a less than ideal home. Susie doesn't even acknowledge the fact that she didn't call anyone, but I would imagine that she's too busy having a good night's sleep for the first time in a long time. Before dozing off, Susie asks Chris a question. Chris can answer one of the four different answers, but what I really want to understand was, what prompted Susie to ask this question? Throughout her time within the cyber dark world, Susie spends a considerable amount of time with Rousey and Noelle, which we only see what transpires with one. The point is, Susie spends time with both of them, and they are both choices that Susie asks Chris who they would rather take to the event. This could just be adolescent gossip, two friends talking to each other about their other friends. What is really the big takeaway here is that Susie trusts Chris with this question. The composition of this scene is wonderful. Susie has become more comfortable physically and emotionally. She is more comfortable expressing her emotions and more comfortable talking about those emotions with Chris. And she confides in Chris with questions she would never ask anyone else. I totally understand what people mean when they say that Susie is the main character. And that was the story of Susie, the Violet Tormentor, so far. And my goodness, what a compelling story it has been so far. The ability to make me absolutely hate a character and eventually accept and love that character is a testament to Toby Fox's excellent storytelling. In his Twit Longer, which released right after Chapter 1, Toby explained that it was Deltarune which was to be his magnum opus. The idea of this game was so vivid within Toby's mind, he spent nights tossing and turning in his bed, unable to stop thinking about this game. I'm not sure how much of Susie was involved with this idea, but I'd like to think that she was at the epicenter. Because of this assumption, I believe that Toby has big plans for Susie. Something is wrong with Chris. And I don't mean in a way that means it's their fault. Whether you believe in the third entity theory or not, something is driving Chris to make decisions. Dangerous decisions, which could have adverse effects on them and everyone around them. Chris is opening up dark fountains. If what Rousey said is true, then this could mean the end of the world. Chris knows this as they were there when Rousey was giving his speech. And yet, they do it anyway. 
I don't know what is drawing Chris to do these things, and neither does Susie. But you know for damn sure that she's going to find out. The Spamton boss fight was just the start. The more you explore, the more secret bosses you uncover, the more potential harm comes to Chris. Susie will worry and question and plead for answers. But she knows more than anyone that Chris can be difficult to talk to. This will not deter her. I suspect the story will send their friendship towards its breaking point, and once again, a line will be drawn. Susie will eventually find out about the Red Soul. She will eventually find out why Rousey doesn't seem to worry even though Chris's actions put them and the world in danger. She will not settle for hand waving or rug sweeping. She will push the issue because she feels like her friend is endangering themselves and the world. Susie will save Chris from themselves. That is my prediction. It's pretty vague prediction to be honest, but if I were to state any specifics, they would be completely made up. We do not know what Chris is planning, but if that plan ever endangers any of Susie's friends, Chris included, she will absolutely thrash them before she lets that happen. As the game progresses, Susie will continue to be tested. And finally, she will have to make a choice. Light world or dark world? Which does she value more? The dark worlds need to exist for Lancer to exist. I honestly don't buy into the fact that the Castletown Dark Fountain is okay to exist when all of these other Dark Fountains can't exist. I think at some point, the Castletown Dark Fountain is going to become so large and massive that even that fountain is going to have to be sealed. And after it is sealed, bye bye Lancer. Susie is going to have to make a choice between the world itself and Lancer. The one question is, is Susie strong enough to make that choice? We'll just have to wait and find out. This has been a character breakdown of Susie from Deltarune, and holy crap this script ballooned out of control. I'm writing this script right now, and I'm dreading the eventual moment that I look back up and see what I actually said. No seriously, did I even say anything interesting, or did I just fall asleep on the keyboard for a few hours? Oh no, I just realized I'm still writing this script and adding more work for me to do later. And now I'm also realizing that I left in this dumb joke, and instead of deleting it, I decided to take the time to record it anyway. But anyway... <laughs> it's no secret that with how rampant short-form content is on YouTube, and everywhere else, it's hard to come by someone who still has the attention span to listen to someone talk about a purple dinosaur for an hour and a half. I tip my hat to you, dear viewer. You are a rare treasure. Unless you just skip to the end of the video, then in that case, oh wow dang you just missed the video. Thank you all so much for watching, goodbye.